We got Prancer and Dancer and Jimbo, Krampus and Jiminy, Petunia. Petunia. How's it going, gang? It's Justin from the Delish Test Kitchen, and the holidays are all about showstoppers, at least from like a food perspective, right? Thanksgiving has turkey, and for Christmas, Hanukkah, all those December holidays, it's all about the beef. It's RB style. We have the meats, and today, we definitely have the meats because we are making the like king, the most impressive thing that you could put on your holiday dinner table, and that is prime rib. When I'm eating prime rib, I'm at my most primal. It's like a big hunk of pink meat. You know when you watch like an old cartoon of like a caveman and they just get a big hunk of meat and they're chowing down on it? That's basically how I feel when I eat prime rib. It's the best feeling in the world. It's exactly how I wanna feel on the holidays. And this is deceptively easy to make. It can be really overwhelming because it's an expensive cut of meat. It's a big cut of meat. But the reality is if you just have a little bit of forethought, Use a little bit of science. We're gonna get this cooked up perfectly. Look. It's, it's very exciting when you get to have something like this in your kitchen. It's very rare that we allow ourselves to spend this amount of money on like one big hunk of meat. And for that reason, we wanna be thinking about what we're getting. We're getting a standing rib roast. That's like the other thing that people might call a prime rib. It's obviously, it's from the ribs of the cow. And this includes a lot of different back meats because cows, they kind of just like graze and don't really do anything all day on their back muscles. So they get really tender and delicious. So think of it like if this, this is this part of our, of our bodies, that's what we're eating when we're eating prime rib. It's getting very little action, so it's very tender. It has a lot of fat and fat tissue, which introduces flavor, really deliciousness, and that's what we're looking for. I've had this in the fridge overnight. Putting your prime rib out, taking it out of whatever packaging you're having it in and having it stand open in the fridge can be kind of intimidating for people to kind of leave raw meat just out. But I promise you, it's totally safe and that will help to dry out the meat. We're not dry aging it. That's like a very long, very controlled process. But this just helps take away some of the moisture from the outside of the beef, which will add, make sure that we have a very beautiful, amazing crust, which is exactly what we're looking for. Justin's question from YouTube. Amazing. Okay, kind of a long-winded question. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> I'm always nervous when I shop for big pieces of meat like prime rib. Me too. How much should I buy per person? Mm. What should I be asking for when I talk to my butcher? That's, all, there's a lot, there's a lot that we're gonna cover in that question. So it being long-winded is totally okay. So I'm gonna address the first part. How much prime rib do we wanna be buying? So the general rule of thumb, you can kind of get, like you see how there's these ribs in here, part of the prime rib. They will be sold sometimes as like, how many ribs do you want? General rule of thumb for any big piece of meat like this, you want about eight ounces per person if you have a bigger appetite or the people you eat with have bigger appetites or you want a lot of leftovers, 12 to 16 ounces is about right. A really simple shortcut if you don't wanna think about weights and you just wanna think about visuals, one rib is good for two people. So for this, it's four ribs. That means eight people are gonna chow down on this. So for the second part of the question of like, what should we be looking for when we're talking to our butcher? First of all, you should be making best friends with your butcher. They're gonna guide you through life. They're gonna teach you all the things that you need to know. It's how I learned everything I know about all things beef, poultry, pork, whatever. But there's so many like different words that are thrown out to you, like grass fred, prime, choice, Angus. It's a lot of different things. Prime rib doesn't mean that it is like prime grade. The grading system that the USDA uses for meat has prime, choice, and select. Select is what you usually buy at the grocery store. Choice is a little bit better, and prime is the creme de la creme of all the cattle in the country. So you can get prime, prime rib, but it's gonna be a prettier penny, but it will make a difference. So if you have the cash, go ahead. You also may have heard the term grass-fed beef. Grass-fed beef is really interesting. Most of what we are used to in this country in terms of what we are looking for in beef, like that buttery, really rich flavor comes from actually something called grain-fed beef, which is how beef was like, and beef cattle have been fed for centuries in America. And it's really delicious. If that is the sort of like more straightforward, all American cow flavor you want, that's what you should go for. Grass-fed adds a little bit of funkiness, a little bit more interestingness. So if you're looking for something that has like a little bit more complexity, go for grass-fed. So that means it's farmy. farmy. Yeah. Farmy, gamey, barnyardy, which I know those words kind of sound intimidating, but I personally, I like that a lot. 
that's like what I look for in all different things like cheese, wine, whatever. So if that's the, if you like go for more interesting wines and cheeses, you might want to go for grass fed beef. Our only seasoning for this roast is going to be salt, pepper, and a lot of it, as well as a bit of chopped, finely chopped rosemary. You want to go over the rosemary with your knife a bunch until you get like kind of like almost like it looks like a coarse black pepper and that will help adhere to the roast and will also keep it from burning. Something I like to do when I'm dealing with big pieces of meat and I know I'm gonna to have to season a lot, I don't want to be dipping back into my salt cellar or twisting my pepper so I'll actually put it on my cutting board just a little bit so that I can actually just go to town pulling it, getting it all over my raw meat and this doesn't get contaminated. We're about to go to town on this here prime rib. Really don't hold back on the seasoning. There's kind of no such thing as over salting this. It is such a big piece of meat. And if you think about it, we're gonna slice into it and there's gonna be like a lot of not exposed parts of it that aren't seasoned. So you're still gonna have to season it afterwards, low key. But we want as much coverage as possible. It's gonna seep into the meat as it cooks. So don't be shy. You really like wanna get intimate with your prime rib. You don't want to hold back. You want to get your fingies in there. You want to make sure that you're getting like these nooks and crannies right in front of the bone, in between. Even though we're actually going to trim off these bones, we want everything seasoned because it's going to make it's going to make everything taste holistically better. It's really important. So get every, like the sides, the bottom, the top, all of it. So a lot of people, a lot of recipes will call for a roasting pan for something like this. I think it's unnecessary. It's expensive. It takes up like a ton of space. So we're gonna be using a couple of things. A normal rimmed baking sheet, some tin foil that I'm gonna line, that's just for easy cleanup, and a drying rack or like a sheet rack, whatever you wanna call one of these things. The whole point of using a roasting pan is to get circulation around the meat, like it kind of suspends it, but you don't need that like basically putting like a metal bucket in your cupboard or in your oven. This does, accomplishes the same thing, and because we're gonna be roasting at a pretty low temperature, we're actually not gonna be getting a ton of moisture coming out. We're gonna have all the moisture retained in the roast itself. So this is like more than enough. It's cheaper, it's easier to store. Definitely recommend doing it this way. We're gonna carefully transfer it into the center of our cooling rack and sheet tray scenario, and then we're gonna get it in the oven. Okay, Justin, mm -hmm. how, do I, how do I get a crust on my prime rib? How do you get a crust on your prime rib? It's a very interesting question because usually we want to introduce a lot of high heat that could be in the form of like searing it in a pan or cooking it for a long time in a hot oven. We don't want to do that because we really want that beautiful iconic like pink mid rare all the way to the edge. And if you cook it too high a heat for too long, you're going to get like in your prime rib, like about like a quarter inch, maybe even a half an inch of gray before it gets to that beautiful mid rare. We don't want that. So we're going to cook low and slow at first. And then at the end, we're going to crank up the temperature, sear off the outside, get like crisply, craggly, salty, deliciousness crust on the outside. It's really easy. My oven's been preheated to 250. You can basically go as low as possible. It'll increase your cook time, but it will also increase the likelihood that you'll get even more beautiful cooking. But most conventional ovens at home only go down to about 250. As a result, this is gonna take about three and a half to four hours to cook. If you want that iconic mid-rare for a prime rib that we're all looking for, it's gonna go to 125, but we wanna pull this steak when an internal thermometer in the thickest part of the meat reaches 120. Once we pull it out and rest it, it's gonna cook an extra five degrees just out on the counter, believe it or not. So 120, about three and a half hours to four hours. This smells amazing in here. It smells beefy, buttery, rosemary y. The whole, literally, people down the hall have stopped in to be like, what the heck are you guys cooking? And I had to tell them, beef! It was, it was beef, and then they walked away, and then it was really awkward. But in any event, we're gonna check this. This has been going for about three hours and 15 minutes. I'm gonna check the temperature. You wanna go into the thickest part, which is easy. You just go right in the middle. Push it all the way through. And that's right, it's gonna be 120. This is 122. I could have pulled it a little bit earlier, but that's okay. Now this is gonna rest. We're gonna tent it with a little bit of foil. And this can actually sit for like 30 minutes and then up to like an hour and a half. Justin, mm -hmm. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Why do I have to rest a roast? Why do we have to rest a roast? The eternal question, why do we have to rest anything? Oftentimes when we cook, we get the instruction to let things cool, let things rest, and it's the most tantalizing, tempting thing ever because we want to just dig into it. But with something like this, it's really important. 
It's about juices and moisture and temperature distribution. Once we pull this out of the oven, all of the juices are kind of like spread out all over the meat. And if you were to just cut right into this, it's gonna leach out. You're gonna have a pool of juices all over your counter. We don't want that. What cooling down the meat and allowing it to rest does, it allows the meats to just redistribute a little bit, kind of like cool down, constrict, and actually go into the muscle fibers and not on the surface of the meat. So that when we slice into it, we're not gonna get those big pools of meat and it's all retained inside of the roast itself. And as I spoke about, there's really not that much juice in this roasting pan, right? Like we, we kept it all inside of the beef itself. We're gonna get this into a 500 degree oven for about eight to 12 minutes, just until everything on the outside is really crackly and a little bit seared and this fat looks a little bit more caramelized and everything on the inside will heat up. And we don't have to rest it again. It's actually perfect. It's you do this right before you're gonna serve. So this can sit on your counter under some foil for about an hour and a half and then right when your guests are ready to eat, you throw it in under a 500 degree oven for like eight to 15 minutes, it'll be perfectly ready. We're gonna serve this very simply. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna remove the rib section from the roast itself. You could serve it on the bone. It would kind of be too thick, I think, for a single person, but I don't know, to each their own. I'm gonna get it off the bone. You just wanna carefully lift it up, get it kind of like on its edge. Use a big and very sharp knife to carefully and slowly slice away the ribs, getting as close to the ribs as possible so you don't lose any of that meat. Once you're there, you're gonna slice it into any type of thickness. People have different thicknesses for prime rib. I am someone who solidly thinks it should not be nice and thin. That's like roast beef territory. This should be like a big honking steak. So like between a half inch, even up to an inch if you wanna go nuts. Guys, we're doing, it's honestly, this is very rare. It's rare for me to be able to eat prime rib. I don't let myself do this often, so I'm gonna give it a quick try. The first thing that stands out to me is the butteriness of this prime rib. There's something about really amazing, high quality US beef that has this like rich, buttery, fatty quality that is unmistakable and is amazing in prime rib. This is tender. You don't have any gray gradient as I was, as I was talking about before. It's nice pink mid-rare all the way to the edge and you have that amazing crust. It's salty, you get that herbal hit from the rosemary, a little woodsy, very holiday-esque. It really, really, really works. It also just looks, can I just say, it looks unbelievable. Like there's a reason that people put this on their holiday table again and again and again. It just is stunning and impressive. And you saw, if we just like take a little time to think about it, it's not even effort. It's just like a little bit of thought. This isn't hard. It just takes a little bit of time and a little bit of forethought. And you're going to have an amazing standing rib roast that's going to impress everybody at your holiday table. But wait, there's more. It's leftover land! There's no music. It's just me breathing. This past month, we've been talking about different, like interesting, like more lunchy and dinnery preparations for leftovers. But in all honesty, we all wake up the next morning after like Thanksgiving, Christmas dinner, and we're craving just more of the food that we had the night before. And breakfast is the best place to do that. So we're gonna be continuing this lavish streak after a night of prime rib and mashed potatoes and all the fixings. We're also going to have steak and eggs in the form of a steak and eggs hash. It's not just any hash. It's gonna have big chunks of prime rib in it. It's delicious. Let's do this. We're gonna chop some red peppers, some onions, and some potatoes. We're gonna par cook those potatoes until they're just a little bit tender. Then we're gonna get into a big skillet with a bit of oil. Those bell peppers and onions, cook them off until they're softened and just getting golden on the edges. We're gonna add a little bit of smoked paprika, salt, pepper, add the potatoes, get those nice and starting to get crispy until we wanna add our steak get that warmed up a little bit. Then we're gonna make like little divots in the skillet, kind of like a shakshuka. And we're gonna crack eggs directly into those divots so that we kind of have this like amazing pre-built breakfast skillet that we can all just kind of scoop from. It's gonna be delicious. It's gonna be really an amazing way to have a holiday leftover breakfast. You hear that? I'm also getting like a steak and eggs facial. It's basically like a breakfast fajitas. This reminds me of the fajitas you get from Chili's. It smells amazing. It smells like smoked paprika and all these amazing ingredients. And the steak just adds a little bit of richness. Who thought like you could have prime rib and eggs, not just steak and eggs. It's so funny to hear it continue sizzling as I'm eating it. It adds to the experience, but this is so good. This is exactly what I want to eat the day after a holiday. 
it feels luxurious, it feels celebratory, it's just as impressive. If you were to drop this big skillet of like steak and eggs on your breakfast table the day after Christmas, it's gonna be just as impressive as that standing rib roast. So for more leftover recipes, for more incredible, impressive mains for your holiday table, stick around and check out delish.com.